Next up, we've got Nicola Peters, who's our newest partner in the litigation department and is our corporate crime partner and is here to talk to us about developments and how it will impact commercial disputes. Um, there's four things I just want to touch on um, this morning. Um, some of you may have seen recently the headline in the FT, Relaxation of UK Bribery Law on Government Agenda. That might have been music to uh, some people's ears given the problems in terms of interpretation, understanding the guidance, understanding when it applies to an organisation, particularly organisations which are incorporated overseas. Um, it's quite early though, obviously in the history of the Act, to be looking at a, a review. We've only had one successful prosecution uh, to date, which some of you may remember was actually a court clerk who was prosecuted for uh, receiving bribes for basically failing to notify DVLA that um, the, uh, the defendant had had points awarded under their licence and he received several bribes and he was a result of a sting operation. He was uh, found to have been involved um, in receiving those bribes. So it comes back to, to the press that we were talking about at the beginning. Um, we're told by the SFO that they've got 15 cases under development in the bribery arena, some pre and post the Act, and we're told that there's seven um, potentially under the, the new Act. Uh, there's been no announced prosecutions under the new Act, particularly in the corporate arena, which is everyone is looking at for, for giving us some guidance on what Section 7 um, means. Um, this story that's in the FT, though, isn't, isn't new. Um, what the FT was saying was that, effectively, the Star Chamber, which, as we know, is the, the government body which has been tackled with effectively deregulizing um, so business can actually get on with business, um, the FT says that they're about to announce the review of the Act. We've not had anything from government on this point yet. Um, but this probably all goes back to a review which was done by a House of Lords Select Committee earlier this year, which was published in February, where they took evidence from a number of um, small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, they took evidence from government as to various things as to how they can develop and how they can support uh, business given the, the problems in terms of uh, the recession. And one of the um, issues that they touched on was the, the bribery act and they had um, quite a lot of evidence given to them about its effect on um, particularly SMEs but also extending to, to larger organisations. Um, one uh, person who spoke to the committee said that the existing Act is virtually impossible to operate as far as a UK company is concerned. You cannot really take someone out to dinner without committing a crime. Now at first blush I think you think that sounds ridiculous. But actually that goes to the foreign public official offence, which has no concept of improperness even, unlike the first um, two offences. So technically under the Act, he's right, what we're given by government is obviously guidance which says that's ridiculous, that's not the intention. But as lawyers it, it is concerning that on the face of one of the offences, um, it basically prohibits taking out foreign public officials for lunch. Now we all know that wasn't the intention. But it, it is concerning that that's what the Act actually says. Um, the evidence to the committee goes on and asks for clearer guidance on the practical application of the Act and the responsibility on SMEs for agents. One of the big concerns was to what extent you're liable for the acts of um, third parties, which goes to the Section 7 offence. <coughs> There's also, though, taken um, with that, so some people, some people are saying, let's have clearer guidance, you know, we need to understand more. On the other hand, some people are saying, well, actually, the guidance we have is too prescriptive. So that, that leads to a nice uh, dichotomy about actually where government is going to go. The other issue that has been raised, um, and we're told it's going to be part of the review when it's announced, is looking at the whole concept of um, facilitation payments. Um, probably some of you know that under the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act they have this exemption for facilitation payments and the UK decided not to go down the FP route, sorry, decided not to exclude FPs from the Bribery Act and make them subject to the Act and said they're bribes as in any other payment which is made. Um, we've had a change of director at the SFO and there's been with that a possible change in stamps. 
Um, and the previous guidance was basically um, that whilst they are illegal and we want to impose a total black ban on them, but we want organisations to work to stamp them out. Now the new guidance which has come out from the SFO um, is to, to reinforce the message that these are illegal and say actually we'll look at the, the, um, the test which is in the code for Crown Prosecutors and is also in the joint guidance which was issued by the DPP and uh, the director of the SFO. I'm not sure though that there is really, if you look down at what's been said by the SFO, there really is a change of substance. The test in the code is exactly the same as it was before in terms of the factors for and against prosecution. So one of the key factors is whether or not the organisation is trying to uh, stamp them out. Um, and actually in a Q&A session, David Green has turned around and said, it isn't the case that there is no flexibility over facilitation payments. So it's interesting as to whether there is actually a true change of um, position by the um, SFO. So if we do have a review, what's it going to look at? Where's it likely uh, to come out? I don't think we are really going to see a change of position in terms of facilitation payments. The US themselves are coming under increasing pressure by the OECD to remove the exemption in, return, in respect of FPs. The OECD, as you may recall, severely criticised the UK back in about 2006-2007 uh, for its approach to bribery, act, um, to, to bribery prosecutions. So I don't think we are going to risk the wrath of the OECD in terms of actually putting in place an exemption for facilitation payments. I think what we're likely to see is the possibility of an extension of, in the guidance. And one of the things I think would be very helpful is for the guidance to become what's known as a safe harbour. And for those who are familiar with money laundering legislation, the Joint Money Laundering Steering Group guidance notes are approved by Treasury and they are a safe harbour in terms of prosecution. And what we mean by safe harbour is that if you can show that you've complied with the guidance, then that the court must take it into account. The test under the Bribery Act is that the guidance issued by the MOJ, the court may take into account, so it's a change of emphasis. So the JMLSG guidance must be taken into account. The guidance issued by the MOJ is a may be taken into account. So I think it would be helpful if actually there was a change of position in terms of, of the guidance. I think what we may though see to be a um, to help business is some further guidance possibly on facilitation payments, emphasising that in certain cases actually they're not facilitation payments, they're payments exerted um, for extortion, under duress, and to give some examples of those types of payments and actually say they are not what we consider to be facilitation payments. I think that would help balance the position between what the OECD is expecting and what business wants and I think that compromise position is probably the only position that the government um, will be able to get to. The only other movement and I think it's interesting where um, the House of Lords Select Committee came to in terms of some of the evidence it referred to was this test of improperness um, in terms of the foreign public official offence and it might be an issue of whether we can actually insert the test of improperness back into that FPO um, offence which is in the Act in terms of section one and section two. The second issue I just want to touch on very quickly is um, the possibility of reform of cr corporate criminal liability generally. Um, the reason for having section seven, the corporate offence in the Bribery Act, was to, to deal with the difficulties of prosecuting large organisations uh, for criminal offences which required some form of uh, mens rea, the mental element of the offence. Under English law, the traditional position was that for offences requiring a mental element, the mens rea part of the offence, um, an organisation could only be guilty where the directing, and, uh, directing mind and will, i.e. senior management, was also, would also be guilty of the same offence. And that, those difficulties were the reasons for introducing um, the Section 7 offence. Both um, David Green, the, the new director of the SFO, 
um, has, has, and um, a Labour uh, policy review which was announced last week and saying what they would do if they came into government in terms of white collar crime have both suggested a possible extension of the Section 7 offence to other types of offences, i.e. importing a concept of strict liability on corporates for the acts of individuals who are associated with them, i.e. acting on their behalf where they are doing those acts in order to obtain business or retain business for the, com uh, for the, for the corporate. The US have a similar um, concept um, called respondant, it's actually respondant superior, um, which is a form of vicarious liability. Even there though there are real problems in terms of interpreting it and its scope, so it needs to be very carefully um, looked at. I think if I was a betting man I don't think we would see anything being done in this parliament. Um, I think business would throw up its arms in horror and say, hold on, we're having enough problems with the Bribery Act and interpreting it. Look, you can't do this at the moment. This is just going to kill British business. Um, I think in the longer term, though, medium to longer term, I think we might see some changes um, given the difficulties of uh, prosecuting uh, corporates. Then, thirdly, I just want to touch on an issue which um, organisations have been um, troubled with uh, recently in terms of whether the SFO has really changed its stance on um, uh, self-reporting. Uh, you may remember that under the previous uh, director of the SFO, Richard Alderman, who had come from HMRC enforcement and therefore probably imported a number of concepts um, from HMRC into the SFO, that he basically said, we want to settle self-referral cases that satisfy paragraph 4 civilly wherever possible. And the relevant factors I've, I've put out on um, the slide. Um, uh, David Green came along last year and basically turned around and said that whereas before the SFO had basically strained every sinew, was the phrase he used, to try and settle cases civilly, uh, that the, he wanted to restate that the SFO were a, a prosecuting organisation that prosecuted criminal offences and were not in the business of trying to settle everything um, civilly. So organisations were left with, well hold on, what does this mean for the, the self-reporting regime? You know, d does this mean actually that it, it's dead in the water? And the self-reporting regime was basically um, set up on the back of a case that Chiz referred to, which was maybe and Johnson that I was involved with. And the factors and the, the approach there basically uh, created the self-reporting guidelines. And so people are concerned, well actually, you know, is Green moving the goalposts in terms of um, self-reporting? I'm not sure that actually he is saying self-reports, uh, we don't want them and actually they are a bad thing. What he does say is that we go back to the test um, for in the code and in the joint prosecution uh, guidance. Um, and what he does say is that a genuinely proactive approach adopted by a corporate management team where the offending is brought to their notice involving self-reporting and remedial action including the compensation of victims will be a factor in deciding not to prosecute. So it will be a factor in terms of the public interest test. And recently, um, as March this year, um, again because of concern as to what that meant for self-reporting. He said, so what is the result? We have said that we will apply the full code test for Crown prosecutors uh, to the available evidence. Assuming there is sufficient evidence, we would prosecute if it was in the public interest to do so. Okay, so that's the code. He then goes on to say, but in the case of a genuine self-report, where, and he gives the example, a new board had discovered previous misconduct under previous management, had investigated it and reported it to the SFO and put in place measures to avoid repetition, then obviously the fact of self-reporting would weigh heavily in the public interest against prosecution. So actually, not that dissimilar to what was being said under Alderman. And if we go to what the SFO has said in relation to deferred prosecution agreements, again the SFO have um, emphasised the importance of genuine self-report and said how important that is in deciding whether or not to enter into a deferred prosecution agreement. So I think whilst there is a, a re-emphasis on the SFO's primary role, i.e. an enforcement and prosecution agency, he is not saying that self-reports are dead in the water. 
what he is saying is self uh, self reports will lead to inappropriate cases a civil settlement i.e. civil recovery and also in other cases may lead to actually a DPA deferred prosecution agreement being entered into when they come into force probably at some time next year so I don't think in reality it's that much of a change I think one point just to, just to flag on that is his his uh, emphasis on the words in the case of a genuine self-report now the difficulty is, is, is that certainly in the corruption arena, if you find um, evidence of uh, corruption, the likelihood is you're going to have to make a money laundering report to soccer as well. And of course, if it's international corruption, they automatically go to the SFO because they are the holders of the register of all allegations of international corruption. So that's going to be an interesting factor actually weighing up you know, the, the self-reporting and also the need to make a, a soccer disclosure and which may therefore influence your timing in terms of going to the SFO. And just finally I just want to flag um, that deferred prosecution agreements which we've probably all heard lots about. Um, the Crime and Courts Act 2013 has just uh, uh, not that long ago received uh, royal assent. Um, we're still waiting for the guidance by both the um, the joint guidance by the DPP and the director of the SFO and also the Sentencing Council guidelines on um, penalties. What we do know is that the regime is likely to come into force in 2014 but that it will apply, so the DPAs will apply retrospectively, i.e. they can be used in respect of crimes which occurred before the DPA regime came into um, effect. And the way it works is that the pros a prosecution will be launched the indictment will be issued at court, but that what will happen is that as soon as that indictment is lodged, it will be suspended. The first hearing will be in private between the prosecution, the defendant and the judge, and at that stage the court will give an indication as to whether it's happy with the proposed um, settlement. If the court is happy, it will then move into an open hearing at a later date. Um, and the statement of facts will be made a matter of public record. So that statement of facts is going to have a potential effect on civil proceedings. Now some people have tried to say, well actually, they, you, you know, there's the, in the response by government they said you don't have to actually admit to the crime, but you're entering into a DPA, you're entering into a statement of agreed facts, I think it's going to have a huge impact on uh, civil proceedings. So that's something that needs to be um, thought about uh, quite carefully. And just to finish off, to go back to one of the points that I, I said earlier, the SFO stated reasons why companies should enter into DPAs, um, emphasising that self-reporting is the right thing to do. Um, and if corporations do not self-report when they've discovered past misconduct, we may well find out anyway and call them in, and this refers back to obviously the um, soccer disclosures which may be made by others in relation to suspicious um, conduct. And I think one of the benefits of the DPA is, is the ability for the corporation, as the SFO has stated, to move on, to draw a line under it, not to invest the huge amounts of management time that would be taken up with a, a trial. Um, I think there's been a lot of talk as to whether DPAs um, are really going to achieve um, what they've been sort of headlined to achieve. Um, and I think the difficulty is that unlike in the US, where we have huge levels of fines, um, in the UK at the moment, we don't have that uh, level of fines, although the court has indicated in Innispec um, a couple of years ago that it wanted to see fines move on in Innispec because the, uh, the company was impecunious, the, the fine was actually at the lower end. Um, but the judge clearly, and it was a, a appeal judge who was moved down, some say deliberately, to deal with this case to send this message out, who said, we are not prepared to accept fines in the amount that's been going on at the moment. We want to see fines at the level of the US and there is no reason for not having fines pitched at that level. I think if the, the justice system moves on and fines and the guidelines from the Sentencing Council indicate that we are going to see fines at the US level, then I think DPAs will be very successful. But I do wonder at the moment whether there's enough advantages for a company entering into a DPA. I think it is watching this space and let's see what the, the guidance um, says.
Thank you. Um, and again, all very relevant stuff that we're dealing with all the time. Uh, do you self-report? Do you let the SFO do their investigation and perhaps not find out all the facts, but with the risk of a criminal pr prosecution at the other end?